Emotiva's C2 Plus Big Honkin' Center Channel. Uh, bottom line up front, it's got a lot of output, not a lot of great linearity, okay? So, let's talk about it. Spin it around, you can see it, check it out. I'm using my wife's Lazy Susan. She would murder me if she saw I took this thing apart for speakers. But, on the back you've got two ports and multi-way binding posts you can buy amp this speaker if you would like. And then on the front, you've got the AMT folded ribbon tweeter. You've got two, I think six and a half inch woofers. And then you've got two, what are they? Three or four inch mid ranges. I can't recall. Y'all can look at the specs if you want to. Uh, those two mid ranges, why two mid ranges? Output, output. What's the problem with having two mid ranges? Linearity, why? Because they're spaced so far apart. So when you have two sound sources and they're spaced a certain width apart, well, those two sound sources act well together as one sound source at lower frequencies. But as you go higher in frequency, they start acting as two separate sound sources and they start fighting each other. And you wind up with comb filtering. And that's exactly what you have in this case with this speaker. It occurs around one and a half kilohertz, which is actually the exact distance of center to center spacing between the two mid ranges. So that's likely why we're seeing some kind of lobing effect between the two center or the two mid ranges up front. And I also think there's probably some kind of internal cabinet resonance just because of the uh, sharp dip to peak that you have in the data. And we'll talk about that now. Can you hear that? Well, yeah, to a degree. If you go looking for it, you can hear it. Um, I will say that I wouldn't necessarily call it offensive. It's about a plus 3 dB bump right around one and a half K and about a minus 3 dB dip right in that same region. Again, we'll see this in the data. But I just, I don't like it. The thing that I really don't like, however, though, is the same things that lead to that comb filtering pattern also occur between these two midwoofers. And when you have that effect going, that, as I said before, it takes your single source of radiation from a, from a speaker or from like just a, a raw omni source drive unit. You put another one next to it, and then you put them apart, well now they're not gonna act the same together even lower in frequency, right? So let's make up numbers. Let's say I've got one sound source and it's fine. No comb filtering going on. I add another one right next to it. Well, let's say that the comb filtering occurs at two kilohertz. Now I'll move them apart. Now that's gonna be one kilohertz. Now I'll move them apart, that's 500 hertz, right? So the further you move these speakers apart, the more lobing and comb filtering you get between those two speakers. Why do you care? because that narrows up the sweet spot, right? So if you have one sound source, there's no sweet spot in this room, right? But when you start adding more and more sound sources, well, you start changing the response and you start changing the sweet spot, which means that if you're sitting dead center of the speaker, you're probably gonna be okay as far as linearity and sound goes. But when you start sitting to the side, like you would in a home theater, like this speaker is designed for, then you've got problems. So your buddy, your wife, your kid, whoever, that's sitting in the seat next to you, not gonna hear the same dialogue that you do, or they'll hear it, but it won't sound as natural, uh, as real, all those subjective terms that we want our systems to sound like. Now, am I picking on Emotiva? Nope, not at all. If you go back and look at my JBL HDI 30, no, 4500, same issue there. It, anytime you have multiple speakers, you're gonna have those kind of things, unless you cross them so low that it no longer matters how far apart they are. But in the real world, that's really just not feasible. And that's one reason why concentric designs are, are really good. Uh, and that's really one reason why I'm not sure that you can beat a concentric or coaxial design for a center channel. Now, why does that matter only for a center channel? Well, as soon as you stand the speaker up, you've got that spread, but it's only vertical. And you're less sensitive to that spread vertically than you are horizontally. Again, I mean, maybe if you're like, listening with stacked chairs and I have somebody sitting up, up above me, directly above me, then that spread, that uh, discontinuity and radiation is going to matter. But horizontally, you know, if the speaker is standing up, it's really not that big of a deal. But when the speaker is laying down and you've got that issue going on, then that's a problem for home theater because people are sitting off axis of the speaker. They're sitting to the side over there. You directly in front of it, probably not that big of a deal. That said, uh, you still have the on-axis linearity issues caused by the comb patterning as well, or the comb filtering, um, because the crossover between the tweeter to the mids 
isn't as low as it should be to combat that. So you still run into those issues. It's a game of compromises. What do you want? Emotiva C2 Plus, do you want perfect linearity or do you want reasonable linearity, a narrow sweet spot and a lot of output? Because that's what you're going to get with this guy. Now, I would be curious to see the C1 Plus. And, and while I'm thinking about it, before I forget, this was loaned to me by Emotiva for review. They haven't seen this. They have no idea that I'm even shooting this video right now. Uh, and I will ask them if they would mind sending me the C1 because I'm willing to bet that the C1 is a more linear speaker, but it just doesn't have the balls that this one does. So let me switch over to the data. And actually, before I do that, you want to know what I think I heard when I listen to the speaker. Okay, so bass, really, really quite good, uh, you know, for, for what it is, for the size of the speaker. Uh, Mid-range is good. The one to two kilohertz region, that's where those issues start to show up. And I, I heard it a little bit before I saw the measurements, but when I saw the measurements, I was like, okay, well that explains why it sounded weird because it wasn't like it was just a boost, it was a, a dip boost. And it, it kind of skewed things up a little bit for me. The high frequency, this tweeter just has a natural high frequency tendency. Maybe they just don't chop it off and level quite a bit or quite enough. Uh, it's too much for me. Now I do really, really like the T2 Plus tower that I reviewed and the B1 Plus monitors that I reviewed and they both share that same characteristic, but for the price that you're paying, cause this is 399 for this speaker. Those are things that I could live with. And most people are gonna have Odyssey or Direct equalization from their AVRs or otherwise. You're gonna run that and you're gonna resolve some of that. You can change it to your heart's content. You can. Do what you want to do for the sound. You can adjust the tonality and whatnot. So I'm not really harping on those too much, but the center spread issue, that's something that is important, needs to be considered for a center channel. So let's jump into the data now and I'll show you what I'm talking about and we'll get a better feel for uh, just how it's going to impact you in your particular home theater room or your living room. First thing I'm going to start off with in the data is the on-axis linearity. Remember I was talking about that dip at about 1.5 kilohertz? Here we go. That, that stretch is beyond, what is that? Negative, that's all about negative six dB compared to the mean. And then it peaks up at about plus dB, plus three dB compared to the mean. And then we start the comb filtering. So this is where I'm thinking you've got some kind of cabinet resonance. And then I think you've got that in conjunction with comb filtering between those two mids. And then the tweeter takes over around here. So you kind of drop that comb filter pattern. Uh, then you've got a dip on axis. I'm going to think that this is diffraction and then a rise in response. And this is where I was saying you can adjust that if you want to, but it's not something that I like. Uh, I'm actually kind of sad to see this kind of response from the speaker given the other Emotiva products. But for a center channel, I really got to say it's par for the course unless you're rocking a coaxial or concentric. You know, I mean, I hate the phrase. It is what it is. But hey, man, it is what it is. Let's talk about low frequency response here. So the F3 is 63 Hertz, F10 is 42 Hertz. What does that mean to you? That means that it'll get down low in frequency with reasonable output, but you're still, I mean, naturally, if you're rocking the center channel, you're still gonna want a subwoofer because you're using it for a home theater. I can't imagine using the center channel for anything else other than home theater purpose. So it's not really that big of a deal, but it is nice to know that it does have decent output going down that low. Overall sensitivity is good. It's close to 90 dB. It's at 89.4 dB on average from 300 Hertz to three kilohertz. And then let's switch over to the CEA 2034 results. Now, all of my measurements are done using Klippel's near field scanner. That is a state of the art measurement device that allows you to get anechoic data in a non anechoic environment. If you are a manufacturer or even if you're a DIYer with a lot of money, you might want to check this thing out because it is the bees knees. You won't need an anechoic chamber. It's actually better than an anechoic chamber because it gives you more accurate data below a certain frequency that most anechoic chambers cannot obtain, which most of them are like 80 Hertz and below that they're not as good. So check out the Clipple near field scanner. The on axis response again is, you know, it's linear through the, through the mid range. It's actually not bad, but man, when we get to that, that mid range, the treble transition area, that's when things start going haywire. Uh, the directivity index though actually looks pretty decent. And then you've got a pretty significant directivity increase right here. So this is where the mid ranges are starting to beam and also in conjunction with their physical offset horizontally. So it's tightening up and that 
pattern is narrowing more forward than it is omnidirectionally. And then here comes the tweeter. So you're dropping back to more omnidirectional pattern and then the tweeter starts to increase in directivity. So not great directivity matching. I'm not really surprised because you have those two mid ranges and actually the mid woofers are doing pretty good. I mean, so the crossover point between the mid woofers to the mid ranges is pretty good. It looks like they're holding directivity pretty well through here, at least based on what I'm seeing in this data. Now let's go look at the estimated in-room response. This is a prediction of what you can expect to hear in your room. And this slope right here is trending down this way. If you kept going with this trend, you're looking at about plus seven dB on the top end. This dip peak thing again, you know, I, I can't really say that that's gonna be problematic. I think more likely what you're gonna hear is this peak right here, then you are gonna hear this dip. I think the peak is gonna be more problematic. Now I can tell you that when I took equalization and I knocked this down, I was happy with it. When I knocked this down, I was happy with it, but I don't know how many equalizers are gonna remedy this dip peak function as quickly as they occur. I mean, you're gonna to to have some really good fear filters or IR filters, depending on what setup you're using uh, on tap. You're gonna to have to have a lot of them too to correct for this and correct for the other things that the room creates. So. That's just kind of a heads up. Now let's talk about the horizontal radiation. Now this is what this graphic is showing. And in red is the prime SPL. So it's the higher SPL region. And generally speaking, that's where you're gonna hear more of the sound from. And as you start trending more toward the orange and then the yellow, that's lower SPL. It's gonna be um, less reflection or less intense reflections coming off the walls and back to you. And for a center channel, what's the number one thing that you want most likely the number one thing that you want is to be able to sit to the side of center because you're going to have guests over watching movies with you or family watching movies and television with you. You don't want to have to have just one primary sweet spot, but unfortunately that's kind of what you're stuck with, with a speaker. Uh, it's about 20 degrees wide through the majority of the response until again, you get to that, that crazy dip peak combo and about 20 degrees wide. I did some calculations on it the other day. I think that means that if you're eight feet away, that you can't go past three feet to the side, of the of the center line of the speaker and then it maybe it was 12 feet away you can't go more than four feet to the side you might be okay with that but i feel like that's kind of on the bleeding edge of things you know if you're eight feet away you probably don't want somebody three feet next to you if you're 12 feet away you may not want somebody you know uh, four feet next to you actually four feet may be reasonable but this is just something to really pay attention to the other thing to note too is just look at how much intensity is lost to the side of the speaker. So you can see really strongly that there's a discontinuity in that mid range to the treble and then boom, here comes the treble, woo buddy. It's spiking up, there's a lot of radiation spread out to the walls. So you have a really mismatched directivity pattern through the, or from the mid range to the treble and that's why you get this falling off response and then a strong pick back up in the treble. I didn't like it. I'll be honest with you. I just did not care for it. But what you're trading with this speaker is you're trading SPL for linearity. And why do I say SPL versus linearity? So let's go look at this. All right. This is at 96 dB. So this is the higher distortion testing that I do. The distortion is below 1% THD all the way down to about 90 Hertz. And then below 90 Hertz, it's, it's still not too bad. It's still below 3% THD until 40 Hertz. That's pretty good. Compression testing. I mean, the compression testing on the low end looks pretty darn good. You're gonna be using a subwoofer, so it's gonna be okay. Uh, this peak or this dip right here concerns me. You're losing about one dB in dynamic range. Whether or not that's gonna be an issue, I'll leave that up to you to decide. The thing that really bothers me the most though about this data is the fact that the tweeter is being compressed so hard. And let's say it's seven kilohertz at 102 dB, uh, down one and a half dB. All things considered, as you're ramping about 26 dB in dynamic range, are you gonna notice that? I can't say that you will. From a data perspective, it's not good. Let's look at the 96 dB, so 20 dB of dynamic range. At 10 kilohertz, you're losing about one and a half dB. Now this is interesting data, it's good to know, and I find it useful when you're talking about comparisons from a really good speaker to a speaker that maybe is not so great in this regard. But again, let's reconsider that you're paying 400 bucks for the speaker, and it can get quite loud. And in my case, I'd be happy if they just took this one and a half dB off the tweeter entirely. Hey. 
I don't know, man. It'd be a lot better. I think you would be less with uh, left with a better sound overall, in my personal opinion. Now, as far as impedance go, can your AVR drive the speaker? Let's look and see. Possibly. Uh, it definitely does dip down to, what is that? That's got to be about 3 ohm, around 150 hertz. But for the most part, it stays above 4 ohm pretty darn well. So I don't know if this is going to be problematic for an AVR. Contact the manufacturer and ask them. And we do see a resonance right around 300 hertz showing up in this data. And then we see something going on here. Again, I'm I'm really banking on there being a resonance right around one and a half kilohertz. And combined with that cone filtering pattern that I discussed earlier, thanks to the horizontal mid ranges being placed, you know, that four and a half inches apart. Now, one last thing I want to talk about, we talked about seating uh, constraints horizontally, so side to side, but what about vertically? Well, vertically isn't really a better story. You really don't need to be below the tweeter line on the speaker, which is where I measure as my reference point. You can be above it by about 10 to 15 degrees. And I'm saying that because uh, the red pattern stays pretty good above the tweeter line up to about this point where it starts to lose output. So if you have a secondary row and they're sitting up a little bit higher, that's good. Just make sure that you're sitting above the tweeter line. Uh, do not put the speaker like above your TV, which I can't imagine anybody's going to do. But I just want to point that out. You do have a sweet spot vertically for the speaker as well as horizontally. That's it for this review. If you like it, if you appreciate it, make sure you leave a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed already, I would appreciate that. Uh, if you're interested in this speaker, I am going to drop an Emotiva affiliate link if you want to purchase it through that. That would help this channel out. And I'm actually going to ask Emotiva if they would mind sending me the C1 Plus because I do think that the C1 Plus might measure better. Um, you would certainly give up output capability, but as far as linearity, that may be the better choice. So when you're trying to balance one or the other and you're on a budget, uh, I think it's good to know what your options are. So I'm going to reach out to them. And if you guys don't mind, maybe just drop a comment below and say, hey, yeah, we'd like to see the C1 Plus measured as well, because then I can use that as ammunition. Say, hey, these people want to see this thing measured. Um, and I guess I might as well go ahead and thank Emotiva for loaning this to me and um, being patient while I completed my review. And with that said, I am out. I hope you all have a good day, night, afternoon, and take care. Yeah, that's it. All right, peace.